Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Tower Casuals, the Destiny podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Corey Deer. alongside me, as always, is the Oten Token, the vault dwelling, mayor of the Deepstone Crypt, and my favorite Destiny uh, podcast host on the Citadel, Jesus Christ, the one and only Josh Finney. Corey, it's Tower Casuals night. It's Tower Casuals night, Josh. It's not like we did 900 other podcasts this week. No, it's not like we definitely may or may not have told you Monday night that you probably weren't getting a show this week, and then magically we did a show because the Schwab this week is too big to not cover. I cannot handle if we have another one that is this size next <laughs> week and get all of it into one 90-minute episode. I'm telling you, this TWAB is thick with like four C's at the end. This this is straight up just one of the best ones. Combine that with... I, I am seeing videos and images on my feed of people getting the Witch Queen Collector's Editions today. Um, th- this is super exciting. This is a great time. The next, we've got 20 days, approximately 20 days. 20 from the days. Time of this, 19, excuse me. We are down to 19 days. 19 days from this moment that we are recording until the Witch Queen is in our hot little hands. Yeah, so if you uh, still need to play Forsaken, you better hurry up. <laughs> You hurry the fuck up. <laughs> um, I speak of hurrying up. I'm, uh, I have been playing with our friend Ray, and uh, you know, trying to go through the list of things I prioritized. I didn't realize that you can't get access to the high celibate or uh, Quaria missions without playing the entire seasonal storyline mm-hmm. connected to them. Mm-hmm. So I'm currently trying to figure out a game plan for blowing through all the splicer content. Oh God, good luck. Um, the season of the lost content, like at least he'll be able to see the exorcism. I assume. I assume everybody will be able to see that. Yeah. I'm not going through the season of the lost story again. I'm just. I'm just yeah. not. Yeah. Uh, I. I will do everything to. We. I was like, yeah. He. He's been around for a lot of it, but uh, he. He knows what's going on. I says, we'll. We'll get Agar Scepter, but uh, mm. I'm not playing through that whole thing again. I will yeah. do all the splicer. The hunt stuff is easy. I will do splicer just for the sake of you being able to experience the expunge missions. Like those are the coolest thing that they did this year in terms of aesthetic. Um, but man, it, it's been a busy week in case you've been living under a rock mm-hmm. or you haven't checked your feeds. Uh, Cause you listen to us right as we come out. We did a special episode on Monday night. Uh, emergency breakdown of the news that we got that Bungie has officially become part of Sony entertainment. Uh, we are not, going to dive into that again tonight there's mm-hmm. no new information that's come out it we literally talked about it for 45 minutes three days ago so if you want to listen we would to be, that yeah we'd be we'd be in a firing squad uh you know a circular firing squad with our previous pod um i joined uh the playstation podcast crossroads and gave some uh some kind of expanded thoughts they uh were kind enough to give me the floor to just let me rant and rave uh for about the last half hour of that episode um you know just the, the important thing, I just want to remind everybody, nothing is changing in terms of Destiny 2. If things do change, it will be for Destiny 3, hypothetically down the line. But through the end of the final shape, nothing is changing. Mm-hmm. No platform exclusives, no bullshit. That is how it is. So nothing's changing for us in the immediate future. Anything else we will cover as it comes up. It's not worth going into. One note I do want to make about Bungie, though, before we dive in. They have hired, and I want to make sure I get the name correct here. They have hired somebody to start building out their, like, media conglomerate. Uh Um, As of yesterday, I want to say, or earlier today. I think it was yesterday. It was yesterday. Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm trying to find... I'm I'm in a feed with a bunch of stuff. I'm trying to find uh, where it was, but... um, uh, Derek Sai, uh, I'm making an assumption on how to pronounce that, uh, previously worked... As a director at as a director at Riot Games on the League of Legends animated short films, he has now been hired as the head of development for the Destiny Universe Transmedia project. Great. Um, this is according to his uh, this is according to his LinkedIn, uh, his official so yeah head of development uh, Transmedia, and that includes film, TV, animation, and books. Uh, his official thing that he has listed here that he wrote out, senior development executive leading projects and telling stories that extend the Destiny IP into new mediums, including film, TV, animation, books, comics, and audio. This is exactly what we've been talking about for a whole year that they need to do. This reinforces my belief uh, that I shared again on Tower Casuals on Monday night on our special episode that you will see a trailer for a Destiny anime this year mm-hmm. at some point yep. or an animated project. What excites me is when they say audio projects, it's anything on the level of like Hunt the Truth or... Um, 
the uh, Inside Infinite ones that they did leading up to Halo Infinite, I, I think that you're in for a real treat here. If it's a web series on the level of uh, Landfall from Halo 3, the Starry Night uh, video from Halo 3, like things like that, that's what I think of when I think of expanding your universe out in little projects at first. Yeah. Um, I mean, never forget the live action Destiny trailers that we've gotten that have all been superb, by the way. Mm hmm. Um, yeah. I see so many people bringing up like, oh, my God, you know, yeah. well, the, the live action trailer from the Game Awards looks so good. I'm like, oh, my sweet summer child. Do you guys not remember you... the original Moon trailer for Destiny? Or One? like the Taken King trailer with uh, Immigrant Song playing? Yeah. Uh, the uh, the Destiny 2 Take Back Earth trailer. Uh, mm -hmm. th there's there's some cool stuff that they've already done. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think like the Halo series is kind of a, a blueprint for how you might see like the Elixir depicted in a hypothetical live action series. I do think live action is a lot harder to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So I do think a lot of this will be through animation just so you can go balls to the wall with everything. But going to be really exciting. I've been steadfast in my opinion. Comics are coming back. I hope that when they say books, it's not. I, I love my grimoire anthologies and my art books, but I really want some original novels set in this universe. I really want, um, I really before want the like, events of the games. I really want either like a, a show or like a novel of like, the events that happened before Destiny One takes place, like the Battle of the Six uh, Fronts, or you know what I mean. So like that, that that's what I—that's what I want to see in the anime series. I want just we call it Destiny Legends, and give us like a forty-five minute episode for each, like kind of like how Star Wars Visions is on D Plus. They gave each episode to a different anime studio. And they went from there. And that took about a year from the announcement until the release. So if you do something like that, conceivably you could have this out. Because I assume you would want to have your first major transmedia push out before the final shape comes. So like really build into the hype there or to release it immediately after. Um, there's a lot. I could literally sit here and speculate all day. We'll, we'll save this for a future topic. But... It's coming. They're hiring people. Uh, they've been hiring people in this discipline for a little while. Uh, they hired a not uh, not a lore curator. They hired a um, like kind of a keeper of the keys for the lore, though, in a lot of ways, um, like kind of a storytelling guide. Uh, there was there's one of those for Star Wars, Pablo Hidalgo, and that's kind of what they're doing here. This is really a first of its kind job in the gaming industry. Um it was a position that was open over the summer. Clearly, that person's going to work really closely with uh, Derek. So, excited to see where we go. They hired an awesome person to do this. God, can you imagine if we get a Destiny, a Destiny series that's as good as Arcane? Oh, I know. Can you imagine? I've heard good things about Arcane. Arcane's awesome. I don't like League of Legends, and Arcane's awesome. They got me interested. So, with that, though, Corey, should we just go ahead and just dive on in throw the caution tape to the wind we have such a massive massive twab to get through we today do. there's a huge um, twab, dude so it's so big <laughs> yeah uh, of course you know we addressed the sony acquisition at the top special episode all that uh one million pre-orders that news broke the next morning after we did the emergency pod one million pre-orders for the witch queen uh, it's on track to be there it's in fact as of right now is the most pre-orders they've ever gotten for an expansion um, which makes sense because this is the one with the most momentum going in and it not being available on Game Pass also probably helps. But 1 million pre-orders. That is, that is absolutely nutty. Um, they, we got an Exotics trailer this week. Uh, encourage you guys to go watch that. We got what looks like an, uh, an LMG, a, a heavy grenade launcher. We got a peek at the Exotic SMG that's a pre-order bonus. Uh, we got a new Titan exotic that will replace your barricade with uh, a stasis wall. Um, we got a warlock uh, set of gauntlets that will increase the range and damage of your uh, cold snap grenades. And then the hunter exotic that will uh, do more damage when you reflect projectiles back with whirlwind guard. Um, so that's cool. Um and as well as uh, the class exotic glaives, the first glaives they'll be class exotic. Uh, the titans get to shoot mini or uh, mini uh, bubbles of light. Uh, we don't, I don't know if we know if those are weapons or armor of light or if we'll be able to pick those. I think we'll be able to pick them based on the weapon crafting we're going to get into. Uh, healing turrets from the warlock one, and uh, the hunters are getting uh, arc web lightning that will uh, shoot and track. 
So all of them sound kind of cool. Uh, they're really trying to go all in on some of these uh, classes. You know, really a lot of support here. I expect to see a lot of usage of at least the Titan and Warlock ones in day one raid groups. Um, that wacky grenade launcher, though, that's got to be the thing that we're all going to hunt for right off the bat, right? Right, yeah. Like, I would not be shocked if that was the raid exotic. I don't think it is, but I wouldn't be shocked. Mm. Uh, you shoot hive worms out of a grenade launcher. I don't know. This, uh, I this sounds like Twitter. This sounds like, I don't know. I bet this is something that it's, it's probably part of a mission that you get after you complete the campaign. I, I'm, I'm sure it is. Uh, this is really cool though. I, I made the comment that I think that every time that I'm like, the exotics are going to be like really boring. Like they're running out of things to do. They surprise me every time. Uh, I really enjoyed seeing just, and I mean, a lot of these are just like, kind of basic, but like, they're really going all in on, if you play Middle Tree Warlock, you can be the ultimate support class now. Um, I guess it's going to be a big one for uh, for soloing content. You know, running around those healing turrets, or the, the Titan Bubbles, even. Um, maybe it eliminates the need for you to actually run Bubble, and you can still run Falling Star with it. I don't know. Uh, there's going to be a lot of wacky combinations you can do. But, if we're going to talk about weapons, we got to move to the Enclave, Corey. Let's do it. The Enclave is set on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, surprise, this has been a theory for a while. We kind of come through uh, the Game Awards trailer clip by clip and had seen what looked to be uh, something reminiscent of the Dust Palace from uh, D1. Mm-hmm. <sighs> but here, let's, uh, let, let, let's talk. Early let's in talk. the Witch Queen campaign, you will be given an introductory quest that runs you through the ins and outs of crafting. In the first and second missions of the Witch Queen Free to All Players, Guardians will uncover the Deep Sight ability to be introduced to the Enclave. This is where you'll shape the first glaive, a brand new weapon archetype. All the necessary materials will be provided for your first crafted weapon, but you'll also be given a short tutorial on how to find those materials for future crafting. A subset of weapons and archetypes will be craftable from the start, but more will be added in the future. In order to shape tools of destruction, you will need to do a bit of research. Patterns are your first requirement. Some will be acquired through quest completions, while others can be earned by completing various gameplay objectives. Once you've earned the desired pattern, it can be crafted at any time with the required materials. Then it's all about the mixings. So I, I want to stop here and look at this, at this first screenshot they give us. Uh, it's for an auto rifle, a solar auto rifle. Uh, come to pass. It tells you what slot it goes in. Solar prime. It's a solar primary. It's an auto rifle. You get the flavor text there, but it breaks down the stats by numbers down there instead of just like kind of looking at it how it is now. You get the numbers. So like when we say uh, you get an extra twenty to something, it's going to show you this in real time how much you're really getting added on stuff. Uh, it looks here that this is the basic screen of you pick your masterwork, you pick your rifling, you pick your like magazine. Your two perks, and then you get your intrinsic trait there at the end. And if you have an appearance customization, you do that at the very end. After reaching the Enclave and crafting the Glaive, random rolled weapons throughout the game have a chance to drop with a new ability, Deep Sight Resonance. This will be used as you begin to target specific traits to craft. As an example, if you find a Deep, Reson deep Sight Resonance Legendary Auto Rifle with the Rampage perk, you can complete an objective and extract the essence of the perk to then craft a weapon with Rampage or another perk that increases damage. So uh, that's a little spicy right there. I already like how that sounds. Uh, if you look at this first screenshot they give you there, uh, you're getting a glimpse at the Titan armor for the Witch Queen, presumably a new sparrow in the back. Uh, kind of a hint at what the artifact will be, as well as what appears to be a Shrieker ghost. Uh, down there in the exotic slot, that looks kind of cool. Yeah. And then uh, there's, th there's three weapons there. You've got the auto rifle there in the secondary slot. you got what appears to be an SMG up in the top and probably a rocket launcher there in the bottom. Yeah. Um, oh, God. I I blew up the picture, so i got to get out of it. Okay. Uh, and the deep sight resonance guns are indicated by a red border as well. Um, they will be different than regular weapons, which have the white border, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, we then get a screenshot of what these deep sight weapons look like, uh, with no progress and they will, uh, they will tell you what you have to do. So for example, on this one, on the SMG on forensic nightmare, 
You look at this weapon possesses a resonance detectable by deep sight. Use this weapon in combat or to complete activities in order to attune the resonance and extract materials useful for shaping weapons. Activity completions and usage of the weapon will progress the resonance objective. Um, so attuning. Think of if you've ever played Dungeons and Dragons, you have to attune to certain items before you can actually use them. You have to equip them and you have to attune to them. You have to like meditate on them or go through some some long and short rests, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, like I have a cloak of teleportation in my campaign. This is very similar. That's This is attunement in video game form. You can have a very basic version of the weapon, but you will not get the top version of it or be able to use these perks on other weapons until you have gone through all the deep sight shit. Okay. Another thing to note is we have those numbers off the side now. The the impact, range, stability, handling, and reload speed are all over there off to the side. You love to see it. Now, down below is where it looks like when it is ready to be attuned because it's done. And you can extract the resonance from it. That doesn't mean, as far as I know, that does not mean that you lose access to the weapon. But that just extracts the perk for you to then use, like, say, in another auto rifle or another SMG is how I'm assuming that this works. Um, like current weapons, not every pattern will be compatible with every trait, but you'll have a good list of traits to mix and match as you customize a given weapon to the desired specifications. Through the Enclave, you'll also be able to kick things up a notch and enhance traits to strengthen their flavor. So this is, this is kind of where it's going to get a little wonky. Um, I'm now understanding why things like weapon parts and... Mod components were taken away, even though I think they would be of a lot of use here, because we, those of us who've been playing forever, have like 20,000 of that stuff staked up. You would be definitely at a disadvantage over everybody else at that point. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at this, so we're, again, we're going to go through, we're going to describe screenshots as we go. Uh, if you're listening to the audio version, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to pull this up and go through it with us so you can visually see what we're talking about. This is a brand new menu, unlike anything that we've seen before in the game. Uh, it's very reminiscent of the lure system, which I don't like, mm -hmm. but, you know, whatever. This is a permanent thing here to say. Hopefully the seasonal stuff becomes simpler to understand. Yeah. Guardians can increase the level by using it in activities and defeating enemies. This is where the bulk of the crafting playtime is. The more you use your weapon, the faster you'll unlock the full potential. Enhanced stats and traits can be unlocked when reaching higher levels, granting slight bonuses to weapon capabilities. Our goal through this system is to give players a reason to invest in their weapons far beyond what Master Working could offer in the past. Each weapon now acts as a long-tail pursuit as you look to make your freshly crafted weapon the best it can be. So we have, we have an image here, okay? of the crafting and it's uh it's of the auto rifle come to pass and when you see here you can choose what frame you want it to be so do you want it to be high impact great your weapon has to be a level seven in order to hit that you have to have resonant out 20 resonant alloy 12 enhancement cores and forty thousand glimmer to be able to do that so you may wonder like oh my god but what if i don't like what i choose what if oh my god like what if i crafted something it's just it's not the best it can be it's not it's not in the meta or something changes like two weeks after i got it they nerf something out of nowhere it can be intimidating to make decisions on how to build your weapon so we're also giving you the ability to reshape crafted weapons in the enclave if you want to mix up the components you could switch up what barrel mags or traits you choose so don't feel like you got locked down one path forever your frame does sound like it's basically the most critical decision to make, mm -hmm. uh, which is understandable. That that changes how fast your rate of fire is. That changes what, like if you're a shotgun, that's going to affect if you're a pellet, if you're a slug, if you're a spread. Uh, it's going to affect how your fusion rifles work. Are you going to be a 360 auto rifle that fires really slow or a 720 uh, like chroma rush that's just right. you know it's a it's like a mini machine gun like. All of these things are affected through your frames. So if you don't know, like, what kind of, like, what different frames do, I would encourage you to use the next few weeks to kind of familiarize yourself with what kind of frames do your favorite weapons use now and that the sandbox changes are going to affect. So you kind of have an idea of what you want going into the Witch Queen. Um, this is something that's going to take weeks if not months for most of us to master i'm sure there will be guides within a week or two of oh my god this is the best stuff to use but i'm sure as far as what's going to be good in the raid we're all at a loss right now this yeah. changes everything yeah 
I'm anticipating having to leave the raid to go reshape weapons at this point. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> That's the unfortunate side effect of this. Um, you will begin to see new legends rise as you begin down this path. Some will prefer hake frames and other foundries. Others may dabble in new weapons from Redacted. We're excited to see what you embrace. Uh, but let's, let's talk about how do you make your weapon unique beyond just beyond the perks and the frame and things like that, because you want your weapons to stand out, right? And exotics have always had ornaments for them, and sometimes they really change the look. Other times they just make your tractor cannon look like a traffic cone. Right, are kind of useless. Mementos are kind of like legendary ornaments is probably the best way I can sum this up. Uh, we used to have those for a few legendaries, specifically for some of the opulent weapons and for the uh, Gambit Prime weapons and the Reckoning weapons, which resulted in a lot of us getting really upset when those activities got taken out. We can no longer earn those ornaments in any way, shape, or form. Bungie's never put them back in the store. Even for things like Gnawing Hunger that have become mainstays in the game. Um, mementos do not seem to be doing that. The majority of the crafting experience is dedicated to mixing, matching, and enhancing traits. There is an opportunity for customization when it comes to appearances and ability or activity-specific trackers. At launch, one weapon memento will become available to players to earn through Gambit, unlocking a Gambit-themed appearance and a tracker. Rank up your weapon to max level, head back to the Enclave, and apply your freshly earned memento for some sweet flair. More of these will come online through Trials of Osiris and Grandmaster Nightfalls. We have more plans for mementos down the line and are excited to introduce a new in-game rarity cosmetics for players to chase as they build out their new arsenal of weaponry. That's not a sarcastic clap. This is what some of us have been begging for for nice. literal years. Right. Sorry, I was about to sneeze, so I didn't respond. No, right you're away. good. <laughs> I, I am, I'm so excited for what this means, not just for that, but that this means we could get this on Artifice Armor in the future. We yeah. could get this on Time Lost Armor, on mm -hmm. you know Master Dungeons, Master Nightfalls. Right. We could get stuff like this. Uh, the possibilities that they are doing with mementos and with the weapon crafting, because we're about to get to another part of weapon crafting, mm -hmm. so, that has me even more excited. Yeah. Corey, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, like the, the changes that they're making right here, is like so we don't really know what's coming after the final shape right but this this stuff that they're changing right now tells me that this game's going to be around a lot longer than you know a little bit after the final shape this um, really feels like the next stage of like we're yeah. moving destiny forward this feels like the final push towards we want to be considered an action mmo and actually mean it <clears throat> yeah because we've joked about it before, like, an action MMO, uh, you're really just a looter shooter with friends. Right. Um, this seems like we are finally punching that in the face and going, nope, here we go. And I think a lot of that ties into this next thing that I... Because when we saw the class-specific glaives, I was like, well, that's cool. We're all going to get an individual quest to go do. It's going to be like getting the subclasses in the Taken King or the swords in the Taken King. This is going to be really cool. I hope it's not like the swords. <laughs> I'm take I did not expect what I'm about to say. <laughs> Legendary weapons aren't the only thing you'll be able to craft. This is the trial for crafting your own armor, I guarantee. Yep. The upcoming Osteo Striga Exotic SMG, which, if you remember, is the pre-order weapon, much like uh, No Time to Explain was last year. Uh -huh. And three class unique exotic glaives can be crafted through the Enclave once you find their respective patterns. While legendary weapons can be crafted from the ground up, exotic crafting is more about fine-tuning something with a defined identity. You may have the opportunity to customize things like barrels or stocks while, while preserving the exotic look and feel. Looking for a longer range profile for the weapon or opting to shred through your enemies up close and personal through the Enclave? You can do just that incredible incredible that that smg is about to become a nightmare with yeah. how you can customize it yeah. but i like that they're not jumping in and saying oh every exotic is able to do this it still seems like this is how dead man's tail and hawk moon being random rolled exotics it seems like this is how those will live on in a mm -hmm. lot of ways yeah it seems that way um, you know, we'll obviously have to get into the game and see, like, well, you know, we know they're saying, you know, you can t fine tune like the barrels, the stocks, the rate of fire, things like that. Mm -hmm. Can we change? You won't be able to change the frame. Well, pro so probably not rate of fire, but 
could we possibly change out the exotic perk? Will there be, if you use this for like 20 hours or something, or you complete, you know, what used to be masterwork objective, you use a lot in Crucible or in Gambit or Trials or something, can a perk drop for you to be able to change out the perk? Like, theoretically, if Dead Man's Tale was part of this, would you be able to earn Vorpal? Like, start out with Snapshot and earn Vorpal, Subsistence, um, Outlaw, things like that. Would you be able to do that for this, hypothetically? Who knows? Right. You know what else this, this kind of reminds me of, too, a little bit, but, like, in a way deeper way is... Remember Kvostov when it came back as an exotic in, in Rise of Iron? The way you could yeah. customize yeah. that was really, like, really deep, and I wonder... I wonder if that weapon will make a comeback at some point. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. I think if it does, at this point, if it didn't come back with the Cosmodrome or with the Loot Cave, um, I know a lot of us were holding out hope it would be part of the Loot Cave or be a secret exotic in the anniversary content. Yeah. Uh, maybe it makes an appearance in the final shape. But that feels like the only other place you could do it at this point, honestly. Yeah. Um. But man, there is... <laughs> There is a lot more here. <laughs> we are, ladies and gentlemen, we are maybe through a third of the Schwab right now. I know. We're um, 26 so. minutes into the recording, so. I am I'm flying through this as quickly as I can. We'll, we'll, we'll gather some more thoughts here before the end. Uh, a couple things I do want to point out, though, um, regarding some of the screenshots you see. So the Come to Pass Auto Rifle specifically. In one screenshot, it's Arc. In one, it's Solar. And this has been a question that has been posed to... Uh, DMG over on Twitter, because uh, that was one of the first things that I noticed as well. Like, are we going to be able to change the elements of our gun? And he was pretty mum on it. He basically said, uh, this may be an error. The team is still working through some stuff. We have not finalized some things. We may not have it. He goes, I may not be able to give you an answer until the game comes out, a.k.a. you may need to find out for yourself. I think this was a mistake. And either these are, it's one of two things. Either these were in development screenshots or they accidentally told us something early that they were supposed to let us find out in game. Right. Those are the only two options I can think of. I think not being able to switch out your elements would be a problem. Like mm -hmm. if you're going to let us craft, let us go all the way with it. Right. Because it would just, it's just on the new weapons. <laughs> you, nothing from before the Witch Queen can be, can this be done with. They will probably reintroduce right. some of those weapons each season. Right. Uh, but we're going to get to the changes in the world is, loophole, which is one of the things we wondered about last week. Yeah. This would be like their way of like sunsetting without sunsetting, you know? Exactly. This this is kind of what the dream for when Black Armory was originally announced. This was kind of my dream for it was, are we going to be able to craft our own weapons? Because the crafting and, and Curse of Osiris sucked. Right. Oh, we could do really then, call that crafting. Yeah. And I mean, like, yes, getting to choose my own loot for Black Armory and for Menagerie was cool. The umbral system is cool. This is the best. And umbrals are still going to exist alongside this. Mm -hmm. Like, we have... N I don't think there's ever been a better way to get loot in this game. On paper. I want to stress, on paper, because we don't know how this is actually going to play out. This could be really cumbersome. And this is, I think, going to be very hard for new Guardians to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, if somebody... If you see somebody having questions about it online after the Witch Queen comes, or even a couple months after, and people are like, oh, I just don't understand. Like, this game seems really confusing. This doesn't seem that bad to me because I've been ingrained for years now in build crafting. Yeah. Um, I taught, you know, I talk strategies with my with my day one team. I taught, you know, we had Johnny on last week to break down loadouts with us and, you know, mods that you should have and stuff like that for a day one raid, going over the ex essential exotics to go ahead and get in your inventory. Because that's like, that's his wheelhouse. Me and him, I think, have been talking all afternoon freaking out about this because we're so ecstatic. Um, but we're going to move on just a little, we're going to move on just a little bit. We're going to, cause we're going to circle back around to all these weapon, all this weapon talk. This is all weapons tonight. Um, from pinnacle to pursuit weapons, uh, as our new one, when pinnacle weapons were introduced, they were tuned and presented as being best in class weapons to act as reward for players dedicated to a particular activity. They motivated players and excited them, but they were expansive, expensive to build for legendary weapons and had some undesirable side effects, such as PvP pinnacle weapons becoming mandatory in PvE, such as Reclusive and Mountaintop, or becoming incredibly unpleasant to play against or so strong that no other weapons in the class could compete in PvP. Mountaintop, not forgotten. 
We didn't go into much detail when we moved away from Pinnacle Weapons, so we'd like to take a moment to clarify the move and also introduce the Pursuit Weapon for next season. The intent as of Season 12 is that a Pursuit Weapon should be a solid weapon, roughly 70% of a god roll in its archetype, with perk options that work well in PvP and PvE, and can be reliably obtained without a huge grind. These should act as a good starter weapon for both PvP and PvE, while leaving space for weapons from Pinnacle activities like Trials, Raids, and Nightfalls to exceed the potential. We generally ship a similar weapon with higher potential in the same season. No, Salvager Salvo basically ignored this guideline, but we really wanted to put Chain Reaction on a special ammo weapon and don't currently see a reason to touch it. Chain Reaction is going to be rare on special weapons, though. Here's a breakdown of how each Pursuit weapon compares to the random world options currently in the game. Adored is a good sniper rifle, but better snipers shift along or alongside or since. A.K.A. Uh, Uzu. You know, the one that I was so upset about that's gone. Uh, I would also put... Um, Succession up there, uh, the primary sniper you can get from the Deepstone Crypt. I put both of those up there as being better, uh, as equal or better. Um, Salvager Salvo Breach Grenade Launcher is a great room clearing weapon, but doesn't have the utility of blinding grenades or auto loading holsters, so other legendary grenade launchers like Truth Teller or Ignition Code can take its place in hardest content. Um, Null Composure is an excellent fusion rifle, and even more so in the season after it shipped and brought back the Reservoir Burst perk. That plug, uh, but Plug One and Glaciochasm can also get Reservoir Burst, and Cartesian Coordinate has better options for DT DPS. The Ascendancy Rocket Launcher brought back Explosive Light, but Hothead can also get this, and it has other good perk options. And with that, let's look at Reckless Endangerment Shotgun. It's coming in Season 16 and introduces the new Steady Hands perk for a massive handling boost after a kill, plus Snapshot. There are other several other shotguns in the release with more sought after PvP and PvE perks. Um, I am excited to see this. This gun looks pretty cool. Uh, I'm excited to see what the ornaments look like on it. But I I, almost, I understand their intent with those weapons, and I think they really nailed that with ascendancy. Like it's a great option, but it's not the best option. There are roles on Royal. There is a role on Royal Entry that is better. Code Duello is still an, a, an incredible Rockets option, um, especially compared with Gallarhorn. But this is by no means a bad one. It is roughly seventy to eighty percent of what you should look for in a rocket launcher. Uh, I would argue Salvager Salvo is the best breach loader in the game, unless you really like blinding grenades. Salvager Salvo is incredible, even in high end content. Uh, Null Composure was shit its first season. It's gotten better since and. Adored is probably still going to be close to a best in class for at least an uh, at least an energy sniper because a lot of them are being taken out of the game. A lot of them are in the world loophole. Um, so I think those are all still really solid options. Another reminder, if you've not gotten those, go do those quests. You don't have much time left. Go get them. Go grab those quests and do them really quickly. They're not hard at all. If you need to get ascendancy, well, grind. Chances are, if you listen to this, you've gotten all these weapons, or at least very close. Please get them. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's I, so I, this, much. <laughs> there's this is like God. There's so much. It's almost I'm looking at. <laughs> it's almost overwhelming at this point. Like it's just like it's almost like a brand new game, pretty much. That we're unpacking here. We're, we're gonna go. We're gonna go through traits and foundry perks. Um. The sandbox changes, which are going to be kind of towards the end, I I'm going to kind of gloss over some of those because just like it's basically a mini patch notes preview is what it is. Um, we'll go over some of the essential stuff, but really like we want to keep focusing on the things that are going to deal with crafting and like weapon pools going forward. So uh, origin traits, let's talk about these. Every weapon that's new or returning in the Witch Queen will have an origin trait determined by its source in a third trait column, including all new legendary weapons and all returning Trials, Iron Banner, and Nightfall weapons. Origin traits will only appear on new drops of a weapon. They won't be retroactively added to older drops. So, that God Roll Peace Bound that I have, it can get better. The God Roll the Death Messenger I have looks like I gotta go flawless again, which I'm not looking forward to. Um... Uh, Multimock is gone, unfortunately, so I can't go get one of those. I will be grinding out a new... Oh, I can't even grind out a new Hung Jury. It's going to be gone as well. Um, a lot of the grindable weapons that I think a lot of us want are gone. But you've got exciting returning ones like the Summoner. Uh, I'm very excited to play with the Summoner now, knowing that I can get a special Trials trait on it. Um, these traits vary in effect, but the guideline is they either have high uptime and medium power effects or low uptime and high power. 
There will be 14 Origin trades in total shipping in the Witch Queen and Season 16 combined, and we expect to ship around three new ones each season after Season 16. For example, one for Season 17, one for the Raider Dungeon, and one for the Seasonal Event until we have one for each event. When we refresh old weapons from a given source, for example, an existing raid or old pool of seasonal weapons, we may create a new origin trait at the same time. So, for me, this means that even if you played a bunch of trials and got a whole bunch of Ingrams this season, Saint is going to be worth grinding out again. Iron Banner is worth grinding. I don't know how much grinding I will do in Iron Banner, though, knowing that a vendor refresh for Saladin is coming. Right. I highly suspect that his weapons will be added to... The crafting pool, if they aren't this season, then definitely in season 17. Yeah. Um, I may only worry about like trying to get a really good peace bound right now and then deal with it later. Because as we're about to break down, you can use traits from different sources for activities within that same thing. So let's go ahead and dive into this. Here are some examples of origin traits. Trials of Osiris. Alice. Uh, Alacruti? Alacruti. Gain increased reload, stability, aim assist, and range when you are the last living member of your fire team. Or, critically, running solo. This is about to be a top-tier perk for solo lost sectors or soloing dungeons. Very excited to see how this perk plays out. It includes plus 20 to reload, plus 20 stability, 10 aim assist, and 10 range. Nightfall strikes. Stunning recovery. Stunning a champion partially refills your magazine. Sugar's health regen and improves recovery for a short duration. Grants 60 health instantly and plus 40 recovery for 3 seconds. Crucible, one quiet moment. Grants increased reload speed when out of combat. Out of combat defines as haven't dealt or received damage in 4 seconds. Hmm. Strikes, the Vanguard Vindication. Final blows with this weapon grant a small amount of health. Small equals 7 health for each final blow. Again, Ooh. another thing I expect to see in high-end content. Mm -hmm. um, anytime it makes sense, due to the source activity, a weapon will have more multiple origin traits selectable. For example, Nightfall weapons can select between Nightfall and Vanguard traits. Trials weapons can select between Trials and Crucible. The Pursuit weapon can select between Gambit, Vanguard, or Crucible traits, since it can be acquired from any of these activities. This is exciting. I can't... I honestly... That... Man, that Crucible stat, I can see being slapped on the shotgun. Um, Vanguard's Vindication, I can see being slapped on it for PvP activities. Um, I, I don't know what the Gambit one is. They, they didn't tell us the Gambit one. Um, we will know what the Gambit perk is, though, when we get farther down. Um, this is what we're talking about with the... Uh, Oh, God, I keep call forgetting it's called a memento. I keep trying to call it the uh, the ornament. <laughs> uh, weapon foundries. There's a whole there's a whole thing uh, in here that's clearly from Banshee. Um, and, you know, we'll do so like mi mini lore corner in the middle of the explanation. Mini lore corner. Guardian, there was something I wanted to tell you. What was it? Banshee scratches his forehead. Oh, yeah, guns. I was cleaning out that locker back there. Banshee motions to a dust-caked storage container. Found a couple things you might be interested in. Side note, I wonder if we're going to get up to that locker where Leviathan's breath was again. Yeah, I wonder. Um, the Exo reaches into the crate next to him and pulls out a glistening Fugue 55 sniper rifle. A stack of shiny new Soros weapons. Manufactured for the Red War by the looks of them. It pierced down the sights of the rifle. Been years since I held a new Soros. Good balance. Solid craftsmanship. This is damn fine work. Banshee stares off wistfully, seeming to forget you're there. His eyes snap back to you, though. What was I going to tell you? Ah, oh, yeah, guns. Banshee uncrates more weapons in mint condition. These were earmarked for Zavala, Drifter, and Shax. Maybe if you're lucky, they'll let you play with them. There's a lot more where that came from. Banshee gestures to a whole stack of crates swimming in a cloud of dust. Hand cans, pulse rifles, Amalon, Hake, Vice. You're going to have a ball. In Season 16, we're replacing the old world loot pool with 12 new weapons in the style of the Destiny 2 Year 1 Foundry weapon sets. Three weapons each from the Suros, Amalon, Hake, and Vice Foundries, plus one Foundry weapon each for Vanguard, Gambit, and Crucible. There are a handful of them that you will find in the Exotic Legendary Ingrams, or not Exotic, the Legendary Ingrams <laughs> uh, on February 22nd. Not all are pictured, mind you. Uh, if you look on there, you can pretty clearly see a sniper, a hand cannon, shoddy, 
uh, a pulse, a scout, and I can't make out if that's an auto rifle or a trace rifle, the Amalon. Um, but this all looks really, I mean, that could also very well be a scout. Um, we talked about foundry perks last week as being a possible thing. Um, you know, John and I have speculated about this on here. Um, I, Corey, I can't remember if uh, we talked about it when you were last on, but this is something I was really hoping to see. And I think this opens the door wide open for the future. Uh, each weapon will come with a foundry origin trait themed around that foundry's personality. Suro Synergy. Reloading grants the weapon bonus handling and reduces incoming flinch for a short time. Hake Breach Armaments. This weapon deals increased damage against vehicles, turrets, barricades, and stasis crystals. Turrets does include stasis crystals, by the way. Plus 15% damage to vehicles, plus 30 to structures and turrets. Amalon Fluid Dynamics. This weapon has increased reload speed and stability for the top half of the magazine. Viced Stinger. Chance to damage part chance on damage to partially refill this weapon's magazine. In addition to the foundry origin trait, each foundry weapon's perk pools lean into that foundry's identity. Big damage for Hake, consistency for Suros, ability tie-ins, and weird stuff for Amalon. Never stop firing for Vice. There will also be a Vanguard shotgun, crucible hand cannon, and a Gambit auto rifle to earn in this upcoming season. I'm almost done. I promise I'm almost done with this section before we get to global changes. Look, there's a lot. People, I think they understand. I got I to take a drink. I got to take a drink. Sippy time. Take a little sip. <sighs> foundry weapons that drop from a source aside from the whirlpool can switch between the foundry trait and that source's trait. This does not imply that foundry weapons will be common outside the whirlpool. So it's basically going to be rare if you get one of these suckers to drop from an activity completion is essentially what I'm gathering here. For example, a role in the new Gambit Hockey High Impact Auto Rifle, Herod C, may look like this. Corkscrew or polygonal rifling, rifling armor piercing and flare magwell, perpetual motion, focus fire. Remember that Gambit origin trait we talked about? It's called Invader Tracker. Maybe you can switch between that or Hockey Breach Armaments for the origin trait the kill tracker and the range master and a range masterwork. We know we haven't brought back all of your favorite foundry weapon types, but don't worry. You can expect to see weapon foundries receive new additions each season for the year following the witch queen with some fun surprises thrown in later in the year. Let's speculate for a minute on that last paragraph. I think everything else is pretty, pretty well explains itself here. When they talk other foundry types, let's think for a second, what foundries are we missing? The notable one for me is Black Armory. Yeah. This feels like they are just teeing up to bring back, a, do a Black Armory. Maybe not Season, but maybe those are the weapons they introduce. Right. Um, the weapons that we had in Season of the Dawn were technically of their own foundry, of, an Os of Osiris. Mm -hmm. Osiris is making. The Sundial. Uh, the Menagerie weapons. Menagerie or really any of the weapons you could get from any of those raids. Yeah, I was going to say like, um, the raid weapons. I suspect that you, when we talked about Redacted earlier as being one of the sources for uh, for blueprints, perhaps we end up getting a, quote, foundry from each enemy type. Maybe there's a way to get, you know, hive-themed weapons. Maybe we have a splicer foundry of uh, the splicer weapons that we had in Season of the Splicer. Maybe it's that and the hunt weapons are, you know, those are for, or the splicer weapons are Mithrax's armory, um... The hunt weapons are ones that we've stolen from shipments destined for the spider. Um, Keitel opens her doors. To, there's a lot of speculation that this is going to be a cabal themed season in season 16. Uh, maybe we get the access. We get access immediately back to the chosen weapons to be able to, you know, craft those or returning menagerie weapons. Um, there's so many possibilities here that you can do that. I think that's really, really exciting when you think about those. I mean, obviously, you know, stasis weapons, those, those are of uh, of the reef. You know, uh, imagine Petro, um, I don't know, Petros products or something, like some stupid name like that. There's so many possibilities for what you can do here. All while maintaining it for story reasons. Right. I think that's a healthy way to rotate back in weapons that have been gone or because with weapon crafting i don't think there's a reason to sunset anymore 
And if something leaves, you can easily just bring it back after the year is over, of course, and say, well, you can you can just, you know, craft it now. It'll be a different perk pool, but you can craft it. And that's a way to keep things relevant, too, because as we're going to get down farther in, some perks are being rotated out and will no longer drop on new weapons. Um, I think that's a, this is a way to keep the game always fresh. You always feel like you're moving forward. Yeah, this is this is a lot. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just like staring at this. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like. <laughs> I do want to say we we are we are done with crafting. All crafting talk is done now. That's the meat of this. We do have basically what amounts to a mini patch notes preview here, which again we're gonna go through. Um, me glancing at this quickly, there are actually some things we need to go through. Um, and some reasonings that we want to explain, but the meat of it was the weapon crafting. Again, highly encourage you to, if you listen to this uh, on audio, if you're still having trouble understanding what I'm saying, um, go back, listen to this with those images pulled up from the squad. Mm-hmm. It will explain it. There may be people who are explaining this a lot better than me. There, um, it's definitely a lot easier to follow along with the TWAB than if you're yeah. just listening. Seriously, like just pull it up on your I, phone. I think or, uh, or I listened to a little bit of his uh, his talk earlier, um, or what he was saying on Twitter at least, uh, and I'm excited to see what his video is about this. Uh, both Ascendant Nomad and Astacross, I think, are going to have really, really good videos on this. Um, and the next episode of uh, DCP Firing Line is probably going to be really good from uh, Fallout Plays. Yeah. Uh, I would encourage those, those are kind of those are some of the guys I really like to listen to when it comes to build crafting and what types of weapons to use. I think they're all going to have good takes. Uh, Datto may have some good ones, especially after we get past a raid weekend. Uh, but this is going to be again, this is going to be something that's we're not going to master this in a couple weeks or a couple days, a couple weeks, maybe not even a season or two. Like this is going to be something that evolves and changes over time, like all the best stuff in Destiny does. Um, so let's go ahead and let's move to, let's move to essentially what is a patch notes preview here. Let's do it. Um, so, uh, kill trackers are inherently on every weapon by default. If they shipped in forsaken or later, there'll be kill trackers added to everything. If it's in your vault, everything. That's cool. Amazing. Great. Great. Um, they'll be present on default by all weapons shipped in Forsaken and later. Exotic weapons prior to Forsaken will be updated in later releases. Yes, this means Master Working is no longer seen as mandatory, and we expect the plus 10 to a weapon stat, or plus 10 to primary stat, plus 3 to other stats for adepts, only to matter to dedicate, dedicated PvP players. We have no specific changes plans for changes to Master Working at this stage, but we will revisit it later. We did discuss gating the origin trait behind Master Working, but ultimately this would not have achieved the goal of weapon differentiation for non-Master Worked weapons. Weapon mods for legendary weapons are now free and instant to insert, and we believe that many pain points around special weapons and Crucible are exacerbated by how easy it currently is to acquire special ammo, and while we touched this in the past, we're making a further adjustment. Players will now only drop one special ammo on death or equivalent, no matter how much they were carrying. The max you can pick up off a special brick is one for a shotgun, fusion rifle, or sniper, or equivalent for other weapons. Scavenger mods add to this as normal, but we'll be evaluating their place in Crucible in the future. Archetypes. Oh, man. Okay. Here, here's, here's, some, <laughs> here's some meat and potatoes for you. Okay. Season 15 Fusion Rifle rework had a lot of moving parts. Uh, All types came out quite strong, but high impact fusions are hurting. We're definitely seen, we definitely seen all fusion rifle subfamilies occupy different roles and want to maintain the large differences in charge time to keep these distinct for now. So we're nudging damage up to make it easier for those to land kills at range in PvP. And we are bumping the PvE damage scaler. That said, we'll keep an eye on how they're doing and may adjust charge time a smidge in the future. High impact fusion rifle damage per bolt goes from 62 to 64. Um, it does not seem like a lot, but it allows more rolls to cross bolts to kill thresholds. Increased high impact fusion rifle PVE damage from 15 to 20%. Um, do, 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 uh, reduced blinding and concussion grenade damage by 25%. Um, rocket launcher subfamilies lack meaningful differences for a while now, and their free tracking precisions are flat out better. So we're pushing them further apart by adjusting damage. Damage adjustment by subfamily. Precision will be 0.95, high impact 1.0, adaptive 1.05, aggressive 1.05. 
Um, da, 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 da. Pulse rifles take slightly too long to kill red bar enemies in PvE. We are buffing their damage versus miners by 10%. But if you want exotic pulse rifles to feel better at this, keep on reading. Exotic weapons. Here is the best change they're making in the entire game, I swear to God. Exotic primary weapons and trace rifles are not sufficiently stronger than legendaries for them to be worth bringing into hard PvE content, particularly against miners. This change, is, this change applies to all exotics that use primary ammo and includes most secondary effects, such as perk-triggered explosions. Increased damage versus miners in PvE by 40%. Yeah. Vex Mythoclass tuning to, against miners was clearly a test run for this. So any weapon that has unlimited ammo that is an exotic, oh boy, we are now, we're, we're cooking now, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh, we cooking, are cooking, frying some eggs. Yep. Graviton Lance is back on the menu. Ooh, frying some bacon. I can't wait. I'm very excited for this. Even when you fry um, bacon, it sounds like little applause. Little applause. Uh, hard light may become viable again. There's there's a lot of things we're gonna have to play with once this game comes out. I once this expansion does. Chaperone is a terror in PvP, and it outperforms weapons that, that ought to be good counters to it, such as sidearms and SMGs. Reduced passive range buff from two meters to 0 .05 meters. Hell yeah! Duality is in a similar place to Chaperone, but not quite as rangy. Having seen it in action for a while, we don't think that a limitation needs to be there. Reduced passive range buff in slug mode from 1.25 to 0 0.05. Pellet mode is unaffected. Terraba is extremely strong as it is, but it currently demands complete commitment with no weapon switching. This constraint is harder than it need, or is harsher than it needs to be, so we've loosened it up without removing it entirely. While the duration extension when damaging players did actually function in PvP, it was so subtle it kept reporting it was bugged. Reduces perk progress by half instead of clearing on weapon stow. Increased ravenous beast duration for increases increases for damaging a player slightly. Ruinous Effigy has been overdue for a look at its Beyond Light nerf. So we're rolling that back. Note that other part of the nerf was the airborne standard melee attack, and this hasn't been touched. Increase the damage dealt by guarding with a transmutation spear by 66% and 30% against other players. Multi-kills now count for orb generation armor oh, mods. Geez. Luminous stats just don't compare with other 140 adaptive hand cannons, and its usage reflects that, so we're updating these alongside some of the legendary hand cannons that also used to be 150. Increased range stats from 44 to 59, base stability from 46 to 56. Sorry, Thorn fans, Thorn is already strong and popular, and a similar buff would make it a monster in PvP. Ooh. Uh, there are some Acre Scepter stuff here. Uh, initial implementation, implementation used Super Regeneration Scalers, which had a very weird effects and activities that also had scalers, so we've re rebuilt it to turn off regeneration while active and have implemented a slower drain using a different method. Um, rebuilt the perk. Used to modify Super Recharge. Rate now freezes Super Recharge and deducts Super directly, fixing several issues with activities that change charge rate and outliers for recharge based on intellect stat. Super should now drain more slowly while empowered. Dead Man's Tail feels good to use on both mouse, keyboard, and controller, and we don't want to go back to it feeling unreliable, but it's far too good at spamming hipfire shots at long range as it stands. The cattle's hipfire rate will be changed from 150 RPM to 130. Uh, Lorenz Driver and Arbalist will have increased flinch received, and Forerunner's uh, ammo economy has been changed. Uh, when you increase the ammo pickup from a special ammo brick from 2 to 3, and from 4 to 5 with a scavenger mod. Man. Legendary weapons. Several legendary weapons have out of band stat out of band stats, either to their benefit, detriment, or a bit of both. When infusion caps were still around, this was okay because they'd cycle out eventually. But now that weapons remain viable in all activities indefinitely, and the solution is to adjust outliers to be in band. The band for legendary 140 hand cannon aim assist ends at 84, and this should be extreme. This extreme should be for a hand cannon from a pinnacle activity like Raider Trials. But when 150s were converted to 140s, many of their stats were either too low or too high. We're adjusting these stats. You guys can come read these on Dire Promise, Waking Vigil, Jack Queen King, and Spare Rations. Bellwinner's Lion Intrinsic Perk makes it far too consistent and lethal compared to similar shotguns, and it's had plenty of time to shine. Plus 15% spread angle. God willing, we've seen the last of Bellwinner's Lie. 
Uh, most of Ikelos SMG stats are wildly out of band for an aggressive SMG, but it does suffer from having a low zoom compared to other popular options. Um, this will no longer be probably a best in class SMG, but it still seems like it'll be pretty decent. Um, again, you can come read these. Typically, we don't adjust base stats on specific weapons at all post ship, so we don't intend to do this regularly. This seems like something they will do at special launches or like maybe at the halfway point of a year. Um, basically, don't expect this for months, if not at all, until like fall. <sighs> Perks, uh, there's a, Josh, there's a take lot a of sip. changes here. You need a sip. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm getting towards the end here. We're, we're getting towards the end. I'm not, I'm not too worried about a lot of the perk ones. Um, you guys can come read some of these uh, for dual loader, Adiago, uh, hip fire grip, etc. Uh, the one I do, I want to highlight a couple that I know that a lot of people use here. Uh, Tap the trigger is the meta breaking perk on a particular fusion rifle. When stacked with other elements, this roll makes fusion rifles much too stable. So much so that we stopped putting it on fusion rifles, and then Squid Face sold it a few times. In case you're wondering, this is about main ingredients. Um, with this change, we believe it's still quite a strong perk without being overpowered, so it's likely to appear on future fusion rifles. We did try reducing stability from plus 40 to plus 20, but play tests, the difference weren't perceptible. On fusion rifles only, reduced stability from 40 to 10. Max recoil angle scale from 0.5 to 0.875. Error angle scale 0.9 to 0.975. That's a whole bunch of nerdy shit right there. Basically tap the trigger on main ingredient. Not as good anymore. Uh, head seeker did not work as, a, as intended on aggressive bull, burst pulse rifles because the buff duration was too short. Sacred Providence is the only viable pulse rifle that benefits from this in season 16. Although there is such a pulse in the season, it does not roll with head seeker. But I expect to see more in future seasons. Buff duration will go from 0.17 to 0.3. Eager Edge. It's a lot of fun to use, but it can be used to do some mind-blowing environment-breaking things if used in particular ways while airborne. The tuning below is not meant to remove the fun factor. We have a fresh raid and other fun content coming with the Witch Queen, and we want to ensure we retain challenge behind our upcoming rewards. Reduce lunge distance benefit while, air while, while airborne by 25%. Now caps maximum player airborne velocity to a fairly high value while active. Occasionally, we're going to shelf perks because they're not working for some reason, either too strong or too weak. This doesn't mean this means we won't put them on weapons in the future unless we change the perk. In many cases, we'd rather put design work into new perks than old ones, but there's a whole perk section here. Anyways, these perks are shelved. Some have been shelved for a while. Bottomless grief and celerity are now gone. Both are attempts to inject some uniqueness into Trials of Osiris and Nightfall weapons, which we're now doing with Origin Traits. Neither of them worked even at, even after the the rework. They were still pretty bad options, I think. Um. Underdog and Shield Disorient are also gone. Uh, Shield Disorient kind of surprises me a little bit, uh, but it's not Disruption Break. Disruption Break, I'd be like, uh, excuse me? And Air Assault. But Air Assault may get a redesign in future seasons. Coming up in the near future, in Season 17, we'll have a set of PvP-focused weapon changes, including new ways for players to build for flinch resistance, balanced tuning for primary weapons such as pulse rifles, lightweights in particular, <laughs> I mean, we'll just pledge maybe good finally uh special weapon tuning snapshot feeling mandatory on snipers and pvp other balance changes another pvp special ammo, ammo economy change if needed adjusting how zoom outliers both low and high affect the performance of a subset of weapons like the scope column shouldn't be the most important thing on a weapon and we're also adjusting several much requested exotics along with legendary perks and there will be a full roundup of patch notes on February the 22nd when the Witch Queen goes live. We will, of course, go over patch notes on the episode that will come out on the 24th when we break down the entirety of the Witch Queen. Um, but that will definitely be a more curated list. This felt like we really need to go through it. They're, they're separated from the patch notes list for a reason. Um, that is the majority of the twop. Let's all, everybody take a breather. Eat, eat, take a take a take five take a five for a snack break. We're almost done. We're almost done. Sippy, sippy. But now, sip. what's going on right now? And oh, go ahead, go ahead, Corey. Uh, any just... any thoughts on what we covered? I guess before we move on. I mean, this is all exciting thing. This is all exciting, right? This is yes. all very, very, very exciting. These are all great changes. Um. 
I I hope that all like because there's so many changes coming, right? That I just I just really yes. hope that they are. I hope they're able to pull it off because it all sounds so great, you know. Ambitious, I think, is the word. Yes, I would use. ambitious is the right word. Yes. Yes. It. I just. I hope they're not biting off more than they can chew at this point. Uh, it, you can tell that a lot of this um, is definitely tying to weapon crafting, and they clearly want you to go through there. Um, some of the perk changes are things that, like, tap the trigger did need a pass on fusion rifles, frankly. Uh, main ingredient, if you had it with that, that uh, Zer sold, oh my god. Which make, leads me to believe maybe they'll sell it one more time before uh, the end of the season, but who knows. Um, I think there's a lot of changes here, though. And we have to take things into consideration here, Right. Like, just because something's getting a pass now doesn't mean it can't be reverted later. We've seen them revert things mid-season before because they got too hard of a hit. And with this being them launching a new weapon type in the Glaive, with them launching, you know, several new exotics, a whole new world pool, whole new season uh, arsenal, new weapons to gain. I mean, new roles to gain on all the existing playlist weapons. Which is I'll probably be playing a lot of Gambit for a new servant leader now. Um, I want that Gambit perk on Servant Leader. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's there's so many things here that, yeah, I think that this is a way that you keep the hardcore players engaged, though. And having those pursuits, trying to get those perfect roles, but now you can craft your perfect one. You just have to work at it. This is the reward for those of us who want to play the end game, who want to grind Grandmasters, who want to play Trials every weekend, who want to raid and do dungeons consistently on day one. This is our reward. Um. This is really making it into a true MMO, I think. This changed more than anything. Yeah. When you combine with what they've done with armor, and especially now with the Artifice armor, I, I think that that just underscores everything at this point. Yeah. Um, I do want to note that um, Damage does say that the next couple swaps will be much lighter. Still have a few things coming to get you all hyped, but we will not have anywhere close to another 6,500 swab for a while. Why not? Um, <laughs> I'm ready to do like, it again people, next week. People were saying on Reddit, they were like, I'm so overwhelmed by this. And it is. like I. This is the fourth or fifth time I've read this today, and I'm still noticing things that I didn't quite realize before. Um, one of these days I would love to just get one of these giant ones and read it for the first time with y'all and like react in real time. But like I said, my day one team has been blowing up my phone all afternoon going, oh my God, like, dude, what do we even do? Like, I have a feeling I'm going to be spending a lot of late nights, uh, at the Enclave crafting weapons, trying out perk combinations and watching YouTube videos to get everybody ready. And that's the most exciting thing about this to me, I think. Um... There was something else I was going to... While we're taking five, there was something else I was going to look up. Um, I saw a comment earlier that I wanted to dive in on uh, from Damage. And uh, I want to find him real fast. Um, find before we... <sighs> My computer runs so slow when I've got all this shit running. Um... Hmm. Hmm. Ah, I got, hate that I have to roll through this. Um, it's okay. Fighting Lion is affected by the 40% buff, by the way, um, to the uh, primary. So I'm actually kind of excited to see what uh, the dedicated users of Fighting Lion do with it. Um, hip fire grip buffs will not apply to the last word. 40% PvE damage buff against red bar enemies will not further apply to Vex Mythoclast. This got that buff last season. We're not doubling up. I wouldn't be shocked to see them revisit it slightly for Mythoclast because it still feels a little underpowered against red bars at times. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked to see them buff it just a tiny, tiny bit. Maybe like another 10%. Um, there will be an in-game tutorial and something to walk people through the process for the first time of crafting... Um, I'm looking to see what else we've got here. Um, beep, bop, beep, ba -doop. Uh, nope. The other, the other main thing is um, checking to make sure you know about the uh, the elemental stuff. I have a feeling this was a bug, unfortunately. Um, which, if it is, I think that's not a blow to my excitement. That, but that is a blow to the 
creativity you can have with weapon crafting. Um, I miss having like three Uriel's gifts, <laughs> one of each. Uh, yeah. Element. God, remember when <laughs> Uriel's gift that. was so? It was like the weapon to have. Oh. Yes. Gosh. Yes. 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 Um. Wow. <clears throat> I, I, I'm I'm double I'm double 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 checking right now to make sure there is nothing else we need to go over. I don't think that there is. Um, before we move on to huh, what's going on in the game right now, because I consistently cannot get them to do the exorcism mission, and I'm very frustrated about it now. <laughs> I'm getting bent out of shape over it. Whoo! God. Okay. Um. Paul and my name is Vife were talking earlier about, you know, this probably means Black Armory is coming back. Uh, he also expressed that uh, Armory, Opulence, and Dawn would come back with their no, new own, own new origin perks uh, because they are sunsets that are not already floating around in the current loophole and they have a really distinct identity that works with the origin concept. Um... Hmm. I need to know what the regrinding is for perks. Um, I don't, I don't want it to be like it's a one-use thing, and I have a very bad feeling that's where we're headed with this. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that it's as simple as, oh well, if you break down that gun, you get those perks back um, to then recraft. But who, who actually knows? Um, the set, uh, Paul, Paul says that uh, we we go to Paul Tassi, of course, because Paul you know breaks this down a little bit better than I can. Uh, since I got here is that it's more about avoiding RNG luck for drops and less about making room in your vault. Uh, kind of worried about vault space even more now unless I'm missing something. So I, I'm very curious to see what happens there. I'm very shocked that as of right now, there's no LMG buff coming, especially when there's an exotic one for this season, for season 16. That actually just kind of shocks me all around that there is right now no LMG buff. Hmm. So we'll see if that actually holds, because if you can't use the exotic from the season very effectively, people are going to be pretty upset. Right, yeah. Um, also a little surprised that as of right now, you can't take that to the crafting table either. I, I, I feel like something that's already underpowered would probably be something you would want people to experiment with, but maybe they don't want that for a future... Ch I don't know. I'm talking out of my ass now. Um... There's some, there's some Lunar New Year stuff going on. If you're a new player that has played any time between uh, January the 2nd and now, um, you will get uh, one of the emotes for free, the Celebration emote. Uh, Pre-launch downtime and preload. To prepare for the launch of the Witch Queen on February 22nd, Destiny 2 will go down at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, so 10 p.m. Eastern, until 9 a.m. Pacific Time, or noon uh, Easter on February the 22nd. It's 14 hours of downtime. Use this time to get some sleep, prep tasty food, or do whatever your heart desires before the Witch Queen. The announcement of 1 million Guardians already having pre-ordered. We're also expecting a bit of a queue as things open up. Preload for the Witch Queen is planned to become available on all platforms beginning at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on February the 21st. So I will definitely be staying up to trigger my download manually. I don't mm -hmm. trust my console doing it overnight. I don't either. So, um, go ahead. Go ahead. I, so they announced that one million guardians have pre-ordered. Does that number seem low to you? No, that number seems high for pre for Destiny. Yes, you think? Yes. Okay. This is a game that right now, this late in this, this is the highest number we've ever seen this late in the season. From what I understand, about eight hundred thousand guardians were live on Monday at the time of the announcement. Right. Um, a Bungie joining Sony. That's unusually high for this late in the season, especially a six month season. People are coming back. Yeah, you know, they're they're trickling back in. This does feel fairly high. They've never told us pre order numbers before. Um, but I mean, you have to remember, last time it was included in Game Pass for Xbox, so that's pot potentially the average daily number for Xbox usually ranges around like the two hundred fifty thousand range. On a typical day, partway through a season, I would imagine. Um, you have to think, like, well, what if, like, 150,000 of them just got it through Game Pass, right? We don't think about the double dippers very often, but you do have to buy the expansion each platform you play it on. Um, 
I don't know. Like we we've only ever gotten the numbers for the base games, and I think it's easier to tout the numbers for a base game because that's a physical thing in stores, and that you're jamming down everyone's throats, as opposed to this is the fifth digital only expansion for an action MMO that most people cemented their opinion on five years ago. Right. So I, I don't know. I think that number is going to climb higher. I wouldn't be surprised to see it hit 1.5, even 2 million before launch. Um, I, I, I don't think it'll hit two, but I don't think it's exactly out of the question either with three weeks to go. People are going to see more advertisements. The, the trailers are coming out. Like even when I was on crossroads this week, Lil Ron was even saying like, I, I don't play destiny, but man, those trailers get me excited. Even though I don't play this, like I'm so I happy mean, for everyone. Bungie is the it. master. I, I mean, not just the wrong. They, they have been since Halo 2. Yeah, you don't know you don't know how many people I've heard like people like, "Man, I don't play Destiny, but these trailers make me really want to try it out." And I'm like, "Right. I mean, you better if you want to try it out, you better jump in now cuz you're going to be so lost. I f- I feel like this is a fans game now, you know. It's so uh, it hard. Is. It, it, it 100% is. It's so hard to recommend Destiny to anybody who's not already like at least a passive fan. And see, that's why the one million number, I think, is surprising. Um, Because this is a fans game now. Most of the purchases for this expansion are pre-orders. And they will be, just flat out. Um, I'm hoping that eventually, like, maybe it will happen when the final shape is on its way. Like, oh, we're going to unvault all the old content. You can manually download it. But, like, here's the the only places that we're going to send you to do for patrol bounties and for story missions and things like that. The other stuff, like, we're not going to go back to those locations, but you can. And, like, maybe you add the strikes from everything into the strike pool. I don't know. I think you have to do something like that eventually, though, and maybe now with the resources of Sony behind them, they can do that. Um, you know, you and I have talked long term about how we really would like to see those be downloadable, just like optional. Like, give me a Red War pack, give me a Leviathan pack. Um, you know, Forsaken, make Forsaken available again. Make uh, you know the Curse of Osiris campaign, the Warmind campaign. You know, things like yeah. this should be in this game. And I think at the very latest, put it in with the final shape. You know, do yeah. it as a pre-order bonus or something. I don't know. Give it free to everybody who wants to play it yeah. um, so that you can experience the entire Destiny 2 story. Because, yeah. like, as rude as it sounds, I love The Taken King. I still think The Taken King is arguably the best expansion that the franchise has ever done. Mm-hmm. Although Forsaken is really damn close. Forsaken's close, but Taken King, dude, Taken the f- King, there's nothing like The Taken King. Even it's like so hard. I mean, the, that the you talk about the Dreadnought, you talk about, like, how mysterious Oryx was, especially at the time, right? Yeah. And like yeah. the how big King the Storm. dreadnought was and how intimidating it was just floating out there by Saturn. And yeah. then at the end of the campaign, he goes into the ascendant realm and you're like, where the hell did he go? And then the raid is still the like the raid is still the most epic raid I think they've ever built up to this point. Like in terms of yeah, like they came very they came very close with Last Wish. Yeah, I'm just... I'm, I'm sorry, so- fighting a giant space dragon is pretty fucking cool. I mean, yeah, that's pretty cool, but, it, I mean, Oryx is a god, and you're fighting a god. And you literally rip its heart out and run through. It's the only Ahamkara left. Like, for lore nerds, I think, that's just so exciting. Like, with Oryx, it was like, yeah, Oryx is so intimidating by size. He was not that big in the campaign. Um, You know, you're seeing him at his full power here, just like when you fought Crota. Uh, and it's just, it, it's, it's wild to me. <clears throat> um, I am, let's see what else is in here. Uh, Shattered Realm will be running daily instead of a weekly rotation so you can get stuff done. Um, GM Nightfall, catch up, no clarification. This, <clears throat> this irritates me because I think this is gone now if you've never gotten the, uh, conqueror seal i think that this is gone i don't think that you'll get this as a regular player anymore going forward which is really frustrating for like double rewards weeks um grandmaster nightfall node has been a catch-up node has been live and is currently available for players who completed the conqueror seal to be able to guild their seal it seems like it's gone for regular players and that's a very aggravating thing to realize yeah um i hate that i hate that i hope they revert that because that's that's especially during a six month season is a gigantic like just kick in the dick when you're taking weapons away too. Um, 
your for content vaulting you guys can go look at the list we've gone over it a million times on here the weapon cycling list we did this last week i'll do it again to remind you trials of osiris will lose igneous hammer and solo scar nightfalls will lose swarm shadow price uzum and hung jury god i wish i could get hung jury with some of those new perks um iron banner will lose multi mock time war inspire guiding sight and steady hand um, claim all Ingrams and other rewards for the new seasons begins. Any rewards not claimed from ritual vendors, Zavala, Shax, Drifter, and Saint will be removed at the end of the season. Uh, so I will be throwing a whole bunch of, uh, stuff at Saint because I have like 10 Ingrams for him. <laughs> so I'm going to get a whole bunch of rolls on weapons that will immediately be dwarfed by those same weapons in the next season. All right. God, I think we're at the end. Are we? Are you sure? I, I, I think we are. Um, yeah, we're. I think we are. I think we are done here uh, with the Schwab. That is a monstrosity. That took us what, like an hour plus to get through. Yeah, I mean we're at an hour fifteen right now. So. Um. I would make one more suggestion just before we head into lore corner and then start to wrap up. If you have the ability to do so, um, if you can even get a checkpoint, I'm not even saying like go through the whole dungeon yourself because it can be a little bit brutal, especially that's Sparrow Chase on Master difficulty. Um, try to get a checkpoint for the Grasp of Avarice Master Dungeon at the boss, and you can farm the boss infinitely for that Artifice Armor. Um, you know, just put it on, put your checkpoint onto another character and, you know, just swap back and forth or have multiple people in your fire team who can do it. Um, Johnny, uh, our friend Phil and I were running this for several hours a couple weekends ago, and we all have a full set of artif- of good stat artifice armor. Uh, like, and good stats, I qualify as 62 or above uh-huh. um, to go into the Witch Queen with. Um, and I think especially for if you play it on day one rating, that's probably the most critical thing you can do to get ready is have at the very least have multiple class items uh, because it costs like nothing to master work those have multiple class items and have because that's where a lot of your like combat style mods are going to come from. You know, your your focusing ones is your thermoclastic um, grab the melees, um, your um, particle deconstruction, etc. All go down there and your arms that's where your champion mods go your reloaders things like that and those are the two most critical uh to have those on right now as it stands and it will never be easier to farm it than it is right now at your max power otherwise you're facing a really uphill climb to try and be able to get into that dungeon before raid day i would say because there it's almost certain that is going to scale up in terms of difficulty you probably will not be able to go in at 1350 to do the master grasp of avarice on launch day like just forewarning all of y'all, it's it's going to be a little tough, I think, to go into that if past dungeons being leveled up like prophecy are any indication. Uh, so just something to kind of keep in mind. This is the time to do that, or Master Vog, if you want to go get one of those time lost fate bringers. I don't know if it's going to be in the rotation anymore before the end of this. Um, this is the time to do those. Um, so with that. Corey, let's go back to the lore corner. We haven't been here in a few weeks. Let's do it. <sighs> We got a little bit more on Sabathun. Um, I've got, I think, one more plan for after this. Um, and then the week before, hopefully, we'll be able to talk about uh, the exorcism. Um, if they don't hold that until the night before the server <laughs> shut down, which I'm going to be really upset if they save that for a Monday night. Yeah, that'd um, be like, hmm, man, I almost wonder at this point if the exorcism will be the literally the first cutscene of or the first mission of the Witch Queen. If that is, that is, first off, that is just such a gigantic kick in the dick. That means they didn't do anything <laughs> with the seasonal. They haven't touched the seasonal story since October. Yeah. And I think that is just so disrespectful to the storytelling team and the players' time. Um, it's got to be. I mean, it's got to be coming. It, it's got to be. There's just too many questions leading into it, and we still have to answer the question of spoiler alert. Mm-hmm. Who dies? Right. Um, and I mean, I've had some wacky theories on this in recent days, um, ranging from the obvious of, ah, it's going to be Osiris to, uh, could it be, could it be Ikora? It's clearly not Mara. Mara's in the marketing for the next expansion. Eris is in it as well. Um, you know, does she take over? Maybe does she take over Eris when the exorcism happens and that kills Eris? Maybe. Um, yeah. 
<clears throat> my wacky because I don't think she kills Crow. If she kills Crow, that's just I think that's poor storytelling on its uh, just like on paper. My suspicion is that when they say that she takes the light, what if she takes the light of Glint away? Man, what if she takes Crow's ghost and that's how she creates her ghost? I mean, that's not out of the out of the realm of possibility. It's certainly not out of the realm of possibility. If it's somebody just like Petra, I'm going to be like, uh, okay. Or what if she... Cool. I mean, like, I know uh, Sagira's dead, but, like, what if they could have extracted the light from her? Like, they found her and extracted Entirely the light Entirely possible. Her? Entirely possible. Yeah. There's so many things that could happen. I mean, and then, I mean, there's also the possibility that the Traveler just chooses to give her the light to help combat the darkness. Mm-hmm. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, which would be a wild heel turn. And at that point... I mean, I've even speculated about this. What if the Witch Queen raid isn't actually Sabathun and it's Zivu Arath? Yeah. There's no way Zivu Arath is the final sister that we face. Yeah. Sabathun is the most cunning of the three hive gods. Um, I could see us having to kill Zivu Arath and then, okay, Alliance I feel with Sabathun like, is gone. Goodbye. I feel like Zivu Arath is going to get uh, a dungeon, maybe. I, I mean, there's no way they could that Zivu Arath could be the raid boss like at all right i mean there, like, there unless is. it's like the mid there like, is but then what the, but why at this point i mean i'm just saying like what the witch queen is just a huge herring we know that zivu has been behind a lot of the events of both hunt and now lost uh she is clearly serving whoever it is commanding the black fleet which you know we suspect to be the harbinger right um i would even go so far to say yeah i'm resurrecting an opinion that i had about the vault of glass or not vault of glass the deep stone crypt before it happened what if we actually meet the harbinger this time yeah what the harbinger is really what's behind zivu wrath and like oh we you know we're about to go you're about to go in for the final bar of health on zivu and the game like goes into an immune phase and the harbinger shows up and just discards her because she's, she failed to kill you and you have to then fight him in a second boss fight before he retreats. How wild would that be? That would be unlike anything we've ever had in a raid before. Just how insane would that be? That would be like on par with finding out Callus was a robot. Right. God, remember so, when that happened and you dropped out into that room and there's just like a whole bunch of Callus bodies. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there's so many things you can do for storytelling, I think. And I don't think that Sabathun is going to be just easily disposed. Because that was one of the main criticisms about Oryx was we beat him in the campaign. And then you beat him in the Ascendant plane. And that's cool. But he was, you know, he was this grandiose thing. They've been building Sabathun for six years now. I don't. And like Zevo Wrath has had a fraction of that. So why not get, get Zevo off the table now? And what if Sabathun's dealt with later in the year? King's Fall comes back, and it's not Oryx. It's Sabathun. It's Queen's Fall. Yeah. How wild would that be? Yeah. Wow. Because Sabathun, when we, because it's inevitable that we're going to kill her, whether it's this expansion or in Lightfall, it it's pretty clear there's like a darkness side and there's a light side. Like the Cabal, right. what's left of Kaido's Cabal, the, the Loyalists from Tortoball, and the Elixni are aligned with humanity. And then on Dark the side, you have the Hive, the Taken, and the Scorn. And whatever, if we end up encountering the Veil or something, they're there, right? right? So you have all those on the other side. That would and that would continue to have, okay, four primary enemy races. And you've got the Vex. The Vex still factor into all this somehow. Yeah. Um, there's so many different routes you can go. So... I'm curious to see what happens, especially after we get that first raid teaser. I can't wait to sit down and dissect every little image of it. It does seem like it's probably going to be a Scorn raid, which, God, if the if the boss is just a fanatic, I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> yeah, I'm be so mad if it's a stupid fanatic back. But let's jump into this lore corner, Corey. Let's, let's do it, it. Let's lore corner. The first one we got is uh, it's petulant. This is from Season of Arrivals. Um, I do believe we read this way back then, but we're going to do it now. Report by Vannet encrypted router, encrypted router. A rebuke to Sabathun for her interference. Perhaps she is jealous of our direct access to the pyramid. She led the hive to the darkness, but she has had eons to regret that choice. Could we exploit this? Personal notes scratched in hive leather with a flake of Ionian stone. I find the Guardian's collective study humiliating. Their channels are full of open speculation about me. 
Is she a helpless lackey of Queen Mara? An ancient proto-hive matron? And why did she offer to trade a bag of quartz ship data stores for a pound of breadfruit? Sabathun, queen of all encrypts. Sabathun, who has distorted these messages so badly that only the tenacious drifter can unscramble them. Why does the hive trickster want to prevent our contact with her god? Simple as answer. It is all a trick. You did exactly as I required as her retort to any defeat. How can her plans be foiled when no one understands what they are? But would she dare defy the deep itself? Perhaps she would. Sabathun's wretched existence is need to confuse. To understand her is to destroy her. Is she still set on luring us into a black hole? Some newborn universe where she can be a true god? Or is that a lie too? Am I on the verge of some discovery that threatens her? Jupiter is always straight above. At night, the whole sky is afire. Tons of sulfur burning in the flux tube that connects Io to the Jovian pole. I burn my trash and the smoke drifts up forever. The radio howls like wolves. I am lonely. Yeah. So uh, that that whole chunk there, that's that's not Sabathun talking. That is, that's Eris. That is, that is Eris talking. Um, which is kind of wild because at first you think, oh, Sabathun is talking about herself. Then you realize it's very clearly about um, Eris. I think one of the big questions here, specifically the line about Mara that you have to ask is, who was it that Mara met with in the court when she told us we had to leave before they arrived? Right. Because they were not a fan. They are not fans of those who wield the light. Like who could that possibly have been? I mean, is there, is there a chance we find out that at some point that it was Sabathun or Zivu or Wrath? Is there a chance we find out it was the Harbinger? Here's the thing. If it's Savathun, like, why would she harness the light if she's not a fan of people who harness the light? I don't know if she's necessarily not a fan. Well, and I mean, like, that, and that's where, like, exact wording comes into play, right? Right. I don't know that it's not that she's not a fan. I think it's that she's jealous of those who have been touched by the light. She especially hates the Guardians because we can wield both light and dark. We've been blessed by both. And she can't get either one of them to recognize her. Hmm. So... I think that's a question to ask, and uh, also I think this this is particularly going to come into play is what is Eris's role in all this? Because sure, Eris's time is nearly up. Um, I feel like Eris is almost. I mean, Eris could very well be the subject of spoiler alert. Maybe the death doesn't happen this season. Maybe it happens at the very onset of the Witch Queen. I could see Eris being just outright killed in a shocking moment because she's the one who's known all about Sabathun this whole time. Uh-huh. Um. And she's being what we know Zavala's being watched. I mean, is Zavala the one? I think that killing Zavala would be the boldest thing that this franchise. I would say that is the boldest thing this franchise has ever done. Is if you kill Zavala before the end of the Light and Dark Saga. Yeah. In terms of killing somebody off, like Cade was shocking because that's the only one we developed a relationship with. Now we have so many beloved characters in this universe. Is is this the end for Zavala? Because that is a Vanguard sidearm. Right. Is it Zavala's time? Uh, so something to kind of keep in mind. Uh, and then... Uh, that would be an interesting the, premise, too, of, like, who would rise up to be, to lead the Guardians because Zavala's been leading them for so long, you know? You And you would assume it's going to be Ikora, but Ikora, is, Ikora clearly is not on the tower in the trailers that we've seen. Yeah. She's working with the Hidden. Um, I mean, would the Guardians rally behind the Crow? I mean, that would be like a real kind of <laughs> reverse Redemption. at that point, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Because so, Zavala trusts him completely, too. Um, Zavala handed the... Van- the Because we know the Vanguard's in shambles. It's never recovered after Cade's death, and now the consensus is broken as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Zavala's barely keeping everybody together. You know, would Ikora choose to retreat after Zavala's death and say, you know, Crow, they're yours to lead. You know, Shax and... Saladin are there to advise him. Drifter is there, etc. Right. Um, this next one is Chapter 5, New Gods. It's from the book Empress at a season of The Chosen. It was Tarin, one of Keitel's advisors that alerted her to the spectacle. In the square, she said, her voice deep, la- her, vo- her deep voice laced with concern. I've never seen anything like it. Cabal, or Keitel went immediately. Not Cabal. Uh, in the central square it's of Portoballs, Weaponsmith District, a bright green flame licked the air. Umanara, Umanareth stood against the blaze, naked but for a waist wrap. 
in the custody of two guards. Her hide was carved with strange crude symbols. When she saw Keitel arrive, she threw her head back and laughed. Here comes the Princess Imperial, she said, to kneel before our new god. I am Savathun whispering. Keitel strode forward. Let her go, she told the guards. Reluctant, they did as she asked. What god, Umun? What heresies have you invented now? Umun grinned. The god of war, she said, and the earth trembled beneath them. But the god of war has planted her armies elsewhere. It is her sister, smiling, that has taken the ear of the war child Umanarath. Keitel stood before Uman in the flickering green light of the fire. Your obsession is a weakness, she said, and a threat to our prosperity. You can't stop it now. Umun lighted, breathless with delight. Zero wrath, hear me. Keitel didn't break her stare. I have no choice but to. Umun chuckled, raising her hands. They glowed. The fire behind her burned higher and shattered like rattling bones. The war is all there is, she said. As the chattering reached a fevered pitch, Keitel made a decision. The lightning quick reflexes Umun had caught her. She unsheathed the ceremonial sword at her side and ran it through Umun's middle. Umun laughed. You are war, and I conjure you with war and blood. She laughed and laughed and laughed until her mouth began to ooze, until Keitel, disgusted, pushed her off the sword with her foot. The body tumbled back onto the green blaze. A gift for my favorite sister. As the fire consumed the corpse, a gargantuan portal opened in the sky. Uh, so this is kind of how Savathun o- opened the door. She may have not been the one who destroyed Torval, but she definitely opened the door for Zivorath to do it herself. Uh-huh. We know Zivorath is the one who destroyed it, so Savathun's been playing people against each other for eons at this point. Yeah. I mean, um, Savathun is just like, she, I mean, she's just had her hand in everything up to this point, it feels like. like everything. Now we're like really yeah. learning about everything she's really had her hand in. It's like, uh, it's almost like... Uh, 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 Kang at the end of Loki, who kind of just like has yeah. controlled everything yeah. to get to make sure like she gets what she wants or like have the ending that she wants, right? And man. right, she's engineered all these paths, and all it takes is for us just to go down one of them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just uh, that's kind of a glimpse into her power, and you know, we know she's the one behind you know the Dreaming City behind. Uh, the behind Riven, you know, behind the last wish, the last wish granted is hers. Right. Um, you know, that her daughter, Duel Karu is the one that's running the murder battery, essentially, in the Shattered Throne in Mara's old Ascendant plane. Mm-hmm. It's it's absolutely wild. Uh, there There's so much left that we don't understand about Sabathun, and yet we know more about her than any of the other enemies that we've ever faced. Yeah, uh, it's it's a very strange situation, and uh, excited to see how our understanding of her evolves over the next year. Because I, I certainly the Witch Queen is not the end. Yeah, yeah. Man, what a what a time! What a time! You know what? I'm about to put on my cool glasses, Josh. Oh, those are cool, Corey. I know. They're not cool. They're okay cool. I got them on my trip last week. They were a swag gift. Oh, boy. But that's this is how I imagine us, after we beat Sabathun in the raid, we just go like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hate you so much. I know. It's great. It's great. Uh, but, yeah. I guess uh, I guess we'll get out of here since we've been recording for ninety minutes. This is uh, hey well, ninety minutes, like right on the mark, man. Let's go, yeah. meet each Schwab, and we were we were concise and in and out. We were, we were. Josh, I appreciate all of your your breakdowns and knowledge tonight. Appreciate you. I really I'm appreciate go you. Go drink like a gallon of water. That's also true. Uh, and I barely talked, so I mean, like, I'm thirsty. I can't imagine what your throat feels like. It's probably like sandpaper. Uh, it's pretty close. <laughs> oh, man. I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening to this episode of Tower Casuals, the Destiny podcast. Remember, if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, please, please, please leave us a five star rating and a nice review. We really appreciate it. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter at Tower Casuals. Josh. Where can we find you? 
Uh, Twitter, at Josh underscore Ben, two ends. Always. Always. Hot takes from Josh. Very hot takes. You can find me at I am Corey and HD on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me uh, hosting the Boss Rush podcast if you want to hear other shows that I do. Uh, Arsenal X Xbox podcast with Josh pops in from time to time. And uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening. And we will see you next time. Goodbye, Guardians. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Mmm.